I'm learning to play the guitar I want to be a country star With hands on fire from plucking barbed wire I'm learning to play the guitar this is the story of a man with a song in his heart. It sounded better there than it did in his mouth, but he wanted to share it with the world. So he went to a city where they understand that a great song begins as a cry of anguish, if only from the audience. I'm learning to play the guitar, please someone stop me. I'm learning to play the guitar. Nashville is the world capital of country music and it wants songs with real words, not just noises. Anyone in the world who even thinks he can write a song like that heads for Nashville, where he soon finds out that he is not alone. You in the music business, sir? Well, no, but I'm hoping to meet a few singers and songwriters and I suppose I've got hopes for a song of my own. Yeah, I'm a songwriter. Really? Sure, i got a tape here. So the first person I met had a song in his pocket. Let the damn drunk sing. He can't hear anything. Puts his heart on his strings. Sets off on frail wings. Let the damn drunk sing. Cause he won't have a life. It wasn't a bad song, and he wasn't a bad singer. I had a song in my pocket too, but if the first cab driver I met was as good as that, then the competition was going to be pretty fierce. Nashville is built high on the bones of songwriters who don't make it. But the ones who do, make it big. On my first walk through the downtown area, I could see the signs of country music stardom on every vertical surface. I could hear those lovelorn lyrics leaking out of every bar. It was the songwriters singing their own songs. Maybe I would have a better chance of getting my own song heard if I actually sang it. But my three-note voice might sound more impressive if I could back it up with a guitar. On the other hand, I didn't want to lay out too much money in case the project failed. So I went to the pawn shop where all the cheap old guitars go to rest between dreams. So many second-hand guitars. Where do they all come from? These are a lot of stories behind these. People come to Nashville to be a recording star, don't make it, and have to get a bus to get back home. So they have to pawn their guitar. And everyone brings it back eventually. Right. How much do you get uh, when you bring it back? Well, if you bought it from me, I give you half of what you pay me for it. Normally, I look it up in the book, and I give you a third of the value of the guitar. Uh -huh. And as long as the interest is paid on a loan, I hold the guitar forever. Uh -huh. But if no interest is paid within 90 days, I legally put it out for sale. Okay. If I told you a really sad story of heartbreak and defeat, I've heard them. <laughs> I've heard them all. Do you recommend a guitar for me about my size? I think I've got one right here you'd really like. Try that. Try my cord. Sounds good. Okay, how much does it cost? Three seventy nine. Mm. Okay, I got. Cash on is 350. Would you consider that? Well, everything in a pawn shop's negotiable, so yes, I sure yeah. would. Okay. Postponing the evil moment when I would actually have to play the thing, I set off to enjoy country music in its humble, pure state. I was given an address on the freeway, but it didn't look very humble. The Opryland Hotel offers the entire country music experience to 5,000 fans from all over the planet, and they never have to step in a single cow pad. 
Opryland Electronics beam the music to anyone in Helsinki or Ho Chi Minh City who can't afford the fare. Opryland is an empire, but its heartbeat is the same Friday night radio show they still call the Grand Old Opry. Veteran star Porter Wagoner is the host. Wow, it's enormous. The auditorium may be new and huge, but the farmhouse backdrop is just as low-tech as it always was, and nothing is more unspoiled than Porter himself. It's the cornerstone to the whole industry, in my view, and uh, I think uh, the Grand Ole Opry is the most important show ever in country music. It's the pinnacle of success to be a member of the Grand Ole Opry. Porter and the other regular Opry performers are a link with the simple past before the industry began to expand around them. The customers pour in by the plane load to pay hard cash for a stage show that is really just a radio show plus rhinestone jackets. Pulling me down, I'm a head to the ground, I'm shaking the soul, cause I have to know the big man him to say. Oh, you got to have a license, yeah, you got to have a license. I asked him why the man replied, cause you got to have a license. All right, boys. For a billion dollar business that packages its new young digitalized video stars in polythene, the Opry is a guarantee that things haven't changed that much. Yep, what counts is still the words, the music, and a straight shooting, your darn tootin' personality to put them over. Brother Oswald played with the famous Roy Acuff band for 50 years. Go and leave me if you wish to never Something about Oswald's approach to a song told me that Nashville still had room for a man with a modest voice and a modest instrument, especially if the latter was returnable in the event of failure. So just like every other aspiring songwriter in Nashville, I went back to my hotel room, picked up my hawk shop guitar, and got to work on my song. If love is brushing someone else's hair, then calling it a crime seems hardly fair. But when that someone else is someone else's, you pay the price for every kiss you Share. Musically speaking, I was starting from a bit behind the other songwriters. Thirty years ago, I had learned a chord, but I had since forgotten it. So now, to give my words notes, I had to start again using an elementary textbook written by the famous guitarist Chet Atkins. The trouble was that the textbook was elementary for him. The full beauties of my song were slow to emerge. It's a cloud and it doesn't rain. It it rise. So next day I set off to see Chet Atkins personally and get a lesson I could understand. I was driven by J.D. Holder, yet another cab driver with a song. On a song called A Tribute to the Service Men. Do you want to hear some of it? Sure. All right, it goes. Uh, in World War One, World War Two, Korea and Vietnam, our service men have fought and died in service to our land. They fought those raging battles across the ocean foam and gave their all for freedom and our safety here at home. J.D.'s song was a little on the gung-ho side, but once again it was disturbingly competent from the music angle. I needed to find Chet Atkins. As a guitarist, he had played on Elvis Presley's first recording of Heartbreak Hotel. As a producer, he had personally helped to invent the Nashville sound. The Nashville of today is partly his creation. Uh, it's like Hollywood was in the 30s, I guess. Uh, uh, back in the 30s, every beautiful person headed for Hollywood to try to get in the movies, and now, if you go out the airport, all you see is people coming in with guitars and and hands full of songs and they hope to make it in the business. Hearing my cue, I produced my pawn shop guitar. Instead of breaking it over my head, 
He offered to help me with my technique. Now I learned I learned this from your book. I reckon it's, that, that's, that's a G chord. That's G. Yeah. And I play all the strings. I think I've got a, I've got a, is that, is that a D? That would be a D chord. It would, that would be a D chord if I was holding it right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The problem is that I, I, I'm so slow getting like five minutes. Well, you got to practice just. Just start it slowly. And you get faster. It's uh, your subconscious does it for you. After you practice while your subconscious takes over and does it for you. I would say, though, that you're a little uh, below above average with your guitar playing. <laughs> it's very, very nice of you to put it like that. <laughs> How much practice? Uh, well, you should. You should. You should do that. One, two, three, four. Wait, wait. Play the bass first. Yeah? Now this bass. And hold the pick. It looks a little weak in your hands. Hold it. Don't lose it. You might lose it inside and have to quit, see, so <laughs> hold it correctly. Is that the big Tightly. What should I be aiming at? Well, uh, if you're going to sing and play, you should just play, learn to play chords like... Or if you want to play solos, you can play... You could be doing it in 30 years, maybe. I could see that I had his sympathy, so I laid my song on him. Someone else's hair, then calling it a crime seems hardly fair deep. But when that someone else is someone else's, you pay the price for every kiss you share. Sh sh share. There's more. <laughs> That's a good comedy song. I like that. Your guitar playing's a little weak, but... And you sing well, too. Comedy song. I thought it was a song of heartbreak. <laughs> no, it's, it's comedy, all right. But the way you change... Uh, then you stop, that reminds me of a comedian. Uh, named Gary Muldeer, and that's how, why he became a comedian. He'd try to sing an E, and he had to make B7, and he couldn't find it, so he'd tell a joke. So he wound up being a comic instead of a guitar player. Well, when you're searching for that chord, just tell a little one-liner, you know. Well, I've got five minutes between chords. I could tell a whole story. <laughs> but that's nice. That's well, I've got, I've got a, a gentleman to the core. Chet was nice about my words, but there was no mistaking what he thought of my music. You pay the so I plucked on far into the night but not too far into the night. Nashville nightlife is too attractive. When the late night looms, even the songwriters go line dancing. I had heard about line dancing from JD, who also lent me some clothes for it. Initially, I was worried that he might have been playing a practical joke. But it turned out that I blended right in. Apparently it was a form of square dancing, except you didn't even have to twirl your partner or any of that stuff. It was simple fun for all the family. You were on your own in company. All you had to do was copy everybody else. Step, step, wiggle, wiggle, kick, kick. This was going to be a cinch. The young lady I had picked as a role model turned out to be the line dancing champion of Tennessee, so what happened next was no surprise. She made it look easy, and it isn't. If the kick is not correctly placed before the wiggle, the next kick will land in the wiggle of the large man in the line behind. Hospitable, like all Nashville citizens, 
Jana Brown took me aside for a pep talk designed to make me less of a hazard in heavy traffic. This was something I was beginning to like about Nashville. Everyone tries to help you become a better person. They feel that if you don't leave the city as a more evolved human being than you arrived, they failed. I really tried to become a better line dancer. I really did. Right, left, right, clap. Good. Okay, let's go from the top. I worked on my wiggle to try and make it look less like a doomed rebellion against chafing jeans. Cha-cha step, rock. Step. Finally, Jana said I was as good as I was ever going to get. When I got back to the dance floor, I was disappointed to find that I was still wiggling when everyone else was kicking. Well, I was here to learn. If I couldn't be a better line dancer, I could at least try to be a better songwriter. And although my music was at an early stage, I was feeling pretty confident about my words. But almost all the other dancers were songwriters too, and they said I shouldn't be ashamed about seeking professional help. Well, maybe tomorrow. Tonight was too much fun. Next day, I had no trouble finding the most successful lyric writer in Nashville. Out on Music Row, there's a bar stool marked by a brass plaque with his name on it. Not that they need it, because he's always sitting there. Where do you get your ideas for your songs? Actually, I get them from conversation. A lot of times people will say something to me, and what they say isn't a title. But I'll switch it around backwards, and I, a lot of the writers do that. Just playing like mental word games, you know. And you just turn something around, and all of a sudden you say, wow, that's an unusual way to say this. And that's, the, that's usually when I reach for a bar napkin and a pen, which I never have on me, it seems like, you know. But I have heard that some classic country songs have been written in about five minutes. Is that possible? Uh, I, I hear young songwriters say this so often, yeah, I wrote that in 15 minutes. And I always think, you dummy. And I, I really think the truth of the matter is you write it in, say, 15 minutes plus your lifetime. I mean, I think writing is a wonderful career and I think it just takes years to really get to be your best so I think your whole accumulated knowledge goes into that song you write later on. As it happens, uh, you know, I've got a, a song with me that I, I wrote and I know it's, it's an imposition because people are doing this to you all the time and I wonder if I could sort of show it to you and get you get your comments. I just have to have two copies of it with me so that I can have one and explain it to you while, okay. while, while you do the other. For the millionth time in his life Harlan took a deep breath and tried to look fascinated. Just looking at it, it's an interesting thought. And uh, it's, oh, it's, it's certainly a little preachy, a little philosophical, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, uh, I guess probably you have to put a melody to it and then get the feel of it and see how that compares well, to what I the words I, are. I've got some idea of a melody. Would, uh -huh. would it be too much of an imposition if I sort of, sort of hum the way I think it goes? Uh, well, go ahead. I mean, in, yeah. in other words, yes. If love is brushing someone else's hair, then calling it a crime seems hardly fair. Key change. But when that someone else is someone else's, you pay the price for every kiss you share. It sounds to me like you're into a pretty interesting thing here. Melodically, I don't feel that at all for, say, this lyric, in other words. In other words, you trim this all down and get it real tight and it's just the right link. And you're saying I've got a lot of work to do? Uh, well, you, or you need to maybe take this to a great melody writer and just say, here, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and see what he gets just from reading it. Get rid of that line. That line. By the time Harlan had finished that crossing line. out the words that no oh, melody would ever save, there wasn't much of my lyric yeah, left. Well, I, I, I had a lot of work to do, but Nashville offers too many distractions. Mule Week, for example. Yes, for one week every year, Nashville is the center of the mule world. The mules were already in the streets, and it was remarkable how many local citizens turned out to see them. None. Just me. Everyone else was indoors writing songs. With the vague idea of meeting a fellow would-be country star who could help me out in the music department, I stopped in at Tootsie's, the history-soaked songwriter's hangout in which Johnny Cash wrote Ring of Fire 
and from which Willie Nelson flung himself on the day he tried to end his career problems under a truck. I just stopped in to have my one or two cause I didn't want to be alone. As always in Nashville, the audience listened in a reverent hush, mentally rewriting the song to fit their own three chords. Somebody drive me home. Thank you very much. George Reeves was the man I was looking for. Yes. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Congratulations. Oh, thank did you. Did you write that song? Yeah, sure did. You come from Nashville? Not originally. I, I moved up here from Georgia. How long have you been in town? Just a few weeks. Uh, did you bring that song with you? Oh, yeah, yeah. Everybody brings songs with them when they come here. Well, I'm afraid I did, too. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Uh, now I've heard your melody. I'm, I'm worried about my melody. Can I sort of uh, ask you uh, to help me with it? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah I love doing that. Yeah, I think it goes roughly like this. Um, Love means brush and sun. George reacted to my singing pretty much the way Harlan had, but George was close enough to the breadline to at least consider the possibilities of collaboration. So we made an appointment to start work after I had kept a date out in the backwoods. Spring was only a week away, and the woods were at their most transparently beautiful. Among the bare pines, the dogwood was blooming like candy dynamite. The roads were pretty out there and carefully planned to get the revenue agents hopelessly lost when they drove up to try and find the moonshine whiskey stills. I was lost myself long before I ran out of gas and it took several hours of crashing on foot through the frosty bracken before I heard music in the distance. It was music as clear as creek water. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. These sounded like the people I was looking for. They handed me a glass of harmless looking liquid but I sensibly put off trying it. Did your forebears ever drive those fast cars, the moon tankers? That the they drove cattle trucks. <laughs> and they had false bottoms in them. And let's just say that, that my daddy had the best travel hogs in this part of the state. Because they'd load the hogs on the truck. The truck had a false bottom in it. They'd haul it out of town. And then they'd just haul it, the pigs back with them. The revenue has never figured out that the pigs were going in two directions. Ah, Daddy never did any time. The music had carried me away, and I made a big mistake. The moonshine's impact gave me insight. This was what it took to be a country guitar picker. Growing up in the country, with nothing else to do at night, because the girls are saving themselves for marriage to a rich musician. Then calling it a crime seems hardly f fair for now. Next day, George and I were on the trail of wealth. When that someone else is someone else's, you pay the price for every kiss you share. What do you think of that? You want this to be a country song, don't you? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Then um, I think I, I might pick and strum it a little bit more. Like... If love means brushing someone else's hair, something like that, then calling it a crime seems hardly fair. Something like that. Yeah. I had an idea for a chorus as well. Okay. Uh, I haven't, I've got no idea for a melody for this, but I think it should have a sort of uh, a dramatic imp, Im, impact. Uh, like, she was someone else's someone, and I got her to forget it for a year, but he was somewhere else. And I was here. 
I like that. This hook line here, she was someone else's someone. That's really, obviously, the hook. I'd repeat that again. And say, it was a meeting of true minds. I had an idea for a lyric and a few words Harlan hadn't crossed out. George had the idea for a tune and a few lines of melody. We would meet in the middle, or we would meet in the pawn shop. Make it go up, and, and make the chord go up too. So you pay the price for every kiss you share, and then go up. She was someone else's someone, and I got her to forget it for years. Something like that, and then repeat it. She was someone else's someone, but he was somewhere else and I was here. We were getting somewhere. The maids started using our corridor again, instead of taking a detour around the other side of the building. We worked on while darkness gathered outside. A whole day and half the night had gone by. My song, which while George was present, I was careful to call our song, was becoming an obsession. All right, let's, let's, uh, let's try it from the top again. I needed a break. Luckily, I had a ticket for Tammy Wynette's latest concert. Tammy was a useful reminder that the great songs have already been written, recorded and made millions. Tammy wasn't in the best of health, but that was what the song was about, being damaged by life. Great country songs are about suffering. Next day, with typical Nashville grace, Tammy granted me an interview to rub the message home. She had started as a poor farm girl and was on her fifth marriage after many troubles. But she had so many gold records, it was like being shown into Fort Knox. Secretly hoping that she was looking for a song like mine, I started by asking her what she looked for in a song. Well, I look for a story, uh, just a story. I like a beginning, a middle, and an end, something that tells me something, tells me a story. Uh, I like... I like the songs that, that I can live with for a while and say, yes, I know that happened because I felt that way. It happened to me. It did this and did that. But I just don't understand how a college graduate can come into town and he's never been married and he has a little girlfriend that he takes out and then he writes a song that sells three million about how, how my wife left me. I don't understand that. I don't know how that could be. Maybe he'll write a different song when his wife does, will you? <laughs> he might. <laughs> Not an honest one anyway, then. You've suffered a lot for love. Is, is love worth it? Oh, yeah, love's worth it. Uh, love's worth anything that you have to go through to get it to last a lifetime. So I made a lot of mistakes, a lot of foolish mistakes that uh, I would hope never to make again. But if it took that for love, then why not? Inspired by Tammy's determination, I was resolved to go on with my song against all the odds. So next afternoon, George and I were standing in line at the Bluebird Cafe. On open mic night, aspiring songwriters, hoping to be heard by talent scouts, can just turn up, put their names in the basket, and take a chance on being allowed to sing as well as listen. You sign for both of us. Okay. Make sure you do it with a V and not a D. They always say Clyde. All right. An hour later, there was no room left for any more songwriters, and the compere explained the procedure. Open mic at the Bluebird Cafe. This is Monday night. This is the Bluebird Cafe. This is open mic in case you're in the wrong place. 150 okay. songwriters um, were all praying to, to hear their names while I was praying not to hear mine. Four, Josh Cooperman. Five, Hank Quinlan. Six, Jim Femino. Seven, Clive James. Eight, Shauna Marie. Nine, Jerry. When I first met you, girl, let me tell you now you were sweet. Lord have mercy, woman, hey, it turned out to be so mean. Some of the early performers were reassuringly in the same embryonic stage of song composition as myself. I will spar with you, I'll Bruce Lee with you. 
wrestle, wrestle you to the ground. As I rehearsed my words, I, I was not without hope. Some of these guys were nearly as old as I was. Gotta have love hooked on the feeling. Gotta have a touch. But this guy was too good altogether, and he was the one before me. Make a little fuss, something that'll mess with your mind. Gotta have love, a little love in your life. Thank you. Uh, my name number seven. No, wait a second. My name. I'm number seven, my name's Clive James, and I come from Sydney, Australia, and, uh, and from London, England. Uh, I've forgotten the first line. Okay, I got it. <coughs> if love means brushing someone else's hair, then calling it a crime seems hardly fair. Luckily, I had George with me to provide the actual music, so I could just hold my guitar and pretend. Otherwise, my nervous fingers would have been plucking frantic flamenco. She was someone else's someone. After singing flat on the first verse, I forgot the words of the chorus, but all the other songwriters in the audience were moved to discover that somebody was going to be worse than they were. I need someone who isn't someone else's I'll find her sometime soon, somehow, somewhere I'll find her sometime soon, somehow, somewhere Leaving George behind to sing a few of his own numbers, I got out in one piece. I was feeling a bit Bruce lee from the strain, but nobody was chasing me except my inner demons, saying, they didn't lynch you, so don't stop now. Why not get a real singer to do a demo tape of the song and hawk it around to the record companies? It was time to pull a few strings instead of just plucking them. After a sleepless night, I had hatched a plan. I had been tipped off that Mark Knopfler of Dire Straits fame was in town to record with the magnificent Nashville musicians. Hoping for free advice about who should sing on the demo session of my song, I invoked the old Powell's act and begged him for an interview without telling him that I had a tape in my pocket. Not yet. How did you first get interested in country music? I'm not so sure that I knew it was country music when I first heard and I suppose that really when I was a child I must have heard blues and rock and blues and country music without realizing that that's what it was because I get the impression as an amateur that it's it's getting very very me mechanical and manufactured especially with the video business you're getting the impression I mean, I mean that's the understatement of the decade I would say uh, it's, it's an it's an industry all right and uh, it's a corporate business based around the radio which is also which is angled towards selling things one so thing I've learned already in Nashville is if you've got a song you want to push you've got to seize every opportunity even if it ruins a friendship so I want to tell you I've got, I just happened to have a tape with me here of, uh, of a song that I wrote and I actually performed it at the Bluebird and I managed to get out alive and I wonder if you could possibly see your way clear towards listening to it If love means brushing someone else's hair Then calling it a crime seems hardly fair But when that Mark surprised me. He showed every sign of actually listening. You pay the price with every kiss you share. <laughs> well, um, it's a lot better than I thought it would be. I mean, you know, it's, uh, 
It's certainly different, Clive. Um, <laughs> um, it's, uh, let's see. Uh, shall I just... Yeah, yeah. There's a lot more of it. And then he really surprised me. Um, you should sing the demo. Me? Like, yeah. You should sing it. But I haven't got a voice. Well, of course you've got a voice, and everybody's got a voice. And uh, I'm not a singer. I don't call, I wouldn't say that, I just sort of stagger from one crisis to the next. And I think that um, you should. It's, your voice has got a, let's call it a, a raw and uh, ragged quality to it, which is, I find, I find it um, a lot more appealing than a lot of the deodorized cowboys that are out there on the radio at the moment. So why not, just as seeing as it's a demo, just to give an idea of the song, it's a lot more intimate, that, just singing it yourself. I'm sure it could be done. I mean, you've got a few pitching problems, but who hasn't? You've got a sort of an interesting nasal whistle at the end of lines that says you, the sound copes with your, nas with your nasal hair, which um, is certainly interesting. It's the voice of sinusitis. <laughs> <laughs> and then he stunned me. Despite his heavy schedule, he offered to set up my demo session himself and, a daunting prospect, back me with his very own guitar. <laughs> but, uh, it'll be fun. Just do it yourself. Don't be too nervous. But setting up the demo session would take 24 hours at least, and I needed to chill out. So I set off for the countryside to soak up the atmosphere of Nashville's biggest attraction, apart from country music. Yes, Mule Week was nearing its climax. The Mule experts were in the last stages of preparation for the soon-to-be-forthcoming grand finale Mule competition. There is a whole art to getting high performance out of a mule. C.C. Sewell is a Formula One mule driver willing to pass on his trade secrets if he thinks you have talent. How do you, how do you make them go? Okay, you want them, you clock to them like that, and I'd go forward. Okay, you want them to go G, say G, and I go right. G's right. Yeah, G's right. Say haul and go left. G, haul. Haul and left. And you want them to stop, just say whoa, and they'll stop. They stop on command, but they won't G and haul on command every time. You have to check your line, make them go G, then put it, make them go haul. Some of them will go haul without pulling them. Most of the time you have to pull them with your line. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. but, yeah. but the thing that gets them going is... Okay. That's right, yeah. yeah. And haul and G. And whoa. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Would you like to me show you? Oh, yeah. Okay. I'd like to see how it's done. But I soon found out that you can't become an instant mule driver just by aping the experts. It takes more than talent. When a mule accelerates, it sorts out the men from the boys. Come up, Pat. Come up, Pat. Within minutes, we were doing almost two miles an hour. The speed of the frenzied mules was so stunning that I seized the first opportunity I could to have a conversation instead. Very exciting ride. Never expected that. <laughs> what does that instruction pat mean? Pat means uh, you call on them and that's their name and they're supposed to go forward and pull better, you see. Oh, Pat's a name? Yeah, that's their name. Oh, that's, right. a, that's a mule's name. Oh, I thought it meant just you go in a circle. They're supposed to go forward and pull better. I thought it meant yeah. go in a circle in a wild manner. Yeah, I know it, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I think I'm a bit too happy. It was clear that I didn't have what it took to be a mule driver. I promised to come back for the grand final, but I would be a spectator. Next day, the demo session was all set up at the famous RCA Studio A, whose floorboards were scarred by the spurs of Porter Wagoner and Waylon Jennings. With you, I think you get a bit nervous. Mark had obviously I taken great be. trouble to study my song and pick out its high points. This is the guy. Three times. He did this by firmly suggesting that I eliminate some of the low points. So my song was that? getting shorter. We get to the solo, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Then there's a solo. Correct. Mm -hmm. nice. Mark had hired the best sound engineers and session musicians in Nashville, yeah. which really means the best in the world. George was proud to be included in such an illustrious lineup. These characters knew what they were doing. It soon became painfully clear that I didn't. That means. Oh God, sorry, I missed it. The, 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 it's just coming in on there. So if you. You know, do I sing first and then you thump in behind me, or should yeah. I wait till I hear something? No, you've got to sing it. So if it's just, it's just, it just keeps yeah. it keeps tempo there, basically. Yeah. In other words, 
it just, it just keeps time. Yeah. That gap keeps time. I didn't know when to start, I didn't know when to stop, and the noises I made in between sounded like a desperate man apologizing for being alive. I got one for the solo. Did I, did I, did I yeah. leave the solo too early? Did I? Yeah, you went to the solo too early. Uh, no, no. You should, yeah, you should have done it for Yeah. That's the solo where we just stopped. Just to make matters worse, Chet Atkins turned up. He told Chuck, the ace sound engineer, that my voice had something, but maybe the technology could get rid of it. Chuck replugged the control panel to minimize my nasal wheeze, and things started going better. If love means brushing someone else's hair, then calling it a crime seems hardly fair But when that someone else is someone else's You pay the price for every kiss you share If love means touching someone else's skin It really doesn't seem that big a sin but when that someone else is someone else's I guess that might be where the sin comes in Then Mark reminded me why he had sold 85 million albums and I hadn't Someone, but her conscience wouldn't let her hide alone. If love means breathing someone else's air, and knowing the next day she'll still be there, I need someone who isn't someone else's. I'll find her sometime soon, somehow, somewhere I'll find her sometime soon, somehow, somewhere For one moment of madness, I thought my singing was a triumph of hidden talent. Later on, I heard the playback and realized it was a triumph of audio engineering. But surely the song was okay. With the right man singing it, it could make a million. Why stop at a million? How about 85 million? It really doesn't seem that big a sin. After another sleepless night, I had the finished tape in my pocket when I went to see one of the most powerful record executives in Nashville, Tony Brown. Songwriters would work any trick to get their tape to him. But I planned to be fair. I would honestly pretend to interview him about the country music industry before I whipped out my tape and laid it on him. Everyone in Nashville wants to be a singer-songwriter. Does that make it easier to find new talent, new material? I don't think it makes it any easier. I mean, just it just means uh, right now, but because country music's so big, it's just the overload of people wanting to get into see you. You have to deal with diplomacy more than you used to in the past. I think. How difficult is it for a newcomer to get a song heard by someone like you? It's it's just you keep trying. You know, you try anybody from the my best friend, a musician who knows me, or somebody who has some uh, pull with me. And who can suggest that I actually listen, you know. But I, I can't say. I've had everything from tapes thrown in car windows to, I mean, everything. 
to get to me. And, and most of the time I hate it, but there has been an occasion where somebody pulled something on me that ended up getting an artist signed. That was all the encouragement I needed. I know you won't misunderstand this, but I just happened to have bought a tape of mine along. How come I'm not surprised? <laughs> a couple I mean, lyric attached. And oh, uh, so this, you actually wrote this and you're singing? Let's put it on and listen to it. See what it sounds like. If love means brushing someone else's hair, then calling it a crime seems hardly fair. But when that someone... He was famous for saying exactly what he thought, no matter how much it hurt. I was ready to hear him say that Johnny Cash might not be immediately available to sing my song. I was ready to hear him say that Garth Brooks might insist on a few small changes. I was even ready to hear him say that my song might need a bit more work. Uh, you know, I, I feel I, I feel the need to be to, uh, and it's not bad. I mean, it, but it's not great either. I mean, it sort of sounds like. A little like Johnny Cash, a little like, uh, it's very simple. And uh, that first line, I would normally, if you hadn't been sitting here, uh, that, that would have probably automatically made me, I don't know, something about opening a song with, if love means brushing someone else's hair. You don't like the idea of the brushing someone else's hair? No, I mean, I just, something about that, that's awful, uh, it's, it's too literal. I mean, you know, I mean, I know country music is simple, but I, I just don't think that, I don't know, it's not very contemporary, and it's, and it's not, I'm having a trouble being, you know, I'm trying to be, uh, I just don't like it. So what you're sort of saying very, in a very indirect manner is you don't like my song. Well, let me, let me be honest with you. I, there's a lot of songs in the top ten that I absolutely hate that are selling a lot of records, so it's not out of the question that, I mean, you could give this to some girl and she could have a hit with it, which maybe she should consider that. It was a crushing disappointment. He had said my song, which I was suddenly ready to call George's song, was no fit thing for a man to be caught dead with. The only glimmer of hope was that a woman might sing it. I sent tapes to every female singer in town but I already felt that I would be lucky to hear that song again, except in my own cab if I ended up driving one. Luckily, there was something to do to take my mind off my despair until the plane left. The Mule Week grand finale. The world-ranking mule handlers were high on adrenaline and all set to fight it out. Even C.C. Sewell would be up against it. In the preliminary events, I saw things done with mules that I would remember for the rest of my life. Any time I was having trouble getting to sleep, I would remember these moments and sleep like a baby. But nothing prepared me for the brain-curdling thrill of the final event, the Grand Prix des Mules. There they were, the fastest mules on earth, racing ear to ear, locked together against the blurred background with death awaiting the slightest error. The skill and courage of the mule drivers took me out of myself. What did a song matter beside the speeding splendor of C.C. Sewell's mules? Purged of pity and terror, I sold back my guitar for half price and packed my bags for the flight home. I phoned George and told him our song was all his. I was philosophically resigned to my failure. But of course, the real songwriters never are. They just keep on trying. Country songwriters are mad about songs, not sane. If they end up driving a cab, they drive it to music. J.D. asked me if it was okay to switch on the radio because the Grand old Opry was about to begin all over again and he never missed it. I said, why not? Now it's time for us to bring another pretty gal out here to, to sing for you. Would you please help me make her welcome, 
Joy Lynn White, ladies and gentlemen. It's amazing the songs you hear on the radio nowadays. J.D. didn't think much of the song because there weren't any soldiers in it, but I thought it sounded pretty good. It just wasn't mine anymore. I was leaving it behind in Nashville, along with someone who knew how to sing it and all the nice people who had helped to write it. But maybe I could write another song all on my own and bring it back. I already had a good idea about a cowboy whose best friend was his mule. If love means breathing someone else's air And knowing that next day he'll see there I need someone who isn't someone else's And I'll find him sometime soon, somehow, somewhere I'll find him sometime soon Somewhere. Thank you. Thank you. Go in. Great job. Pretty song.